Hi everyone, my name is Abigail Estrera and I'm the Educational Programs Manager at ACMA. It's a real pleasure to have you join us today for our monthly webinars on building careers in the pharmaceutical industry for clinical and scientific professionals. Welcome. It's a real pleasure. I am pleased to introduce you the ACMA Life Sciences Associate, Dr. Kenneth Dixon, who is a pharmacist by training and subject matter expert on all things related to becoming board certified in medical affairs, as well as career opportunities in the pharma industry for those with scientific and clinical background. With that, I will turn it over to Kenna, who will briefly present an overview, which I think you will find very helpful. Thanks, Abby. Um, as Abby mentioned, my name is Kiana, and as a pharmacist with the ACMA, my role here as a life sciences associate is to really provide information to not only ACMA, but also to interested professionals like you all here joining us today um, about the life sciences industry. So thank you all for joining us today again to discuss these multiple career options and different opportunities available in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, my goal today is for us to really highlight the different roles in pharma, specifically in medical affairs. Um, you'll see that these career options that we're going to talk about today, they're suitable for many professionals um, with a clinical or a scientific background across the life sciences industry. Yes, including not only PharmDs and MDs, but also our nurses and nurse practitioners. Again, anyone with a clinical background. I also wanted to mention before we start um, how we'll approach questions this afternoon. So please ask your questions in the question and answer. I think it says Q&A, the feature of Zoom, you'll find it at the bottom of your screen. Um, so Abby will be reviewing and noting these questions throughout the webinar um, and we'll address those at the end. But first we have a poll question. Um, so we've included a few po poll questions throughout the webinar to increase in interactivity and also for us to learn more about our audience today. So, what will happen is that you'll see a question that will pop up on your screen, um, and you can actually select the answer that best suits you. Let's see. Has the first question already popped up, Abby? There we go. So here we have the poll. We have yes. our first two questions. Um, and so you can go ahead, and I'll give you about 30 seconds to take a look over these and answer these questions. All right, so that's about 30 seconds. The first question is just us um, to assess, you know, your, your best of your background um, and also what you were hoping to gain from the webinar today. Um, so we'll actually use this information to kind of tailor our conversation today, um, as well as the questions at the end. So it looks like we have a lot of pharmacists in here today. Um, again, I'm biased because I'm a pharmacist. Um, and then we also see an option. Uh, what do we hope to gain from the webinar today? Gain more insights and information on the pharmaceutical industry and their career options. So you'll see that we'll definitely um, hit each of these points and we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar and these career opportunities. All right, so to get started, we'll just do a brief, quick overview. Um, so with the pharmaceutical industry, you are working somewhere along the drug development um, in one of these departments within the pharmaceutical industry. Now, again, as an overview, as a reminder, uh, the drug development process that includes multiple organizations along the pipeline. I mean, many aspects of this process along the pipeline is actually handled by the individual pharmaceutical company within the industry, um, whose goal, again, is to create drugs and get those approved by the regulatory agency in their region. For example, here in the U.S., um, a pharma company would need approval by the FDA, for example. So moving through um, each of these brief uh, departments and teams. First up, we have the research or clinical development team. It says, says it right in his name. You know, the role is to develop and to drive that research of a new drug or product for the pharmaceutical company. Um, this team really oversees all clinical trials. 
Next, we have the medical affairs team. This team is probably one of the largest teams within a pharmaceutical company. Um, if you look up what a medical affairs professional does, you know, it'll tell you something about scientific communications, which is true. Uh, the functions of med affairs, they're more broadly defined as data generation and data dissemination. And we'll actually highlight and dive into these specific functions um, next and throughout the rest of the webinar. Next, we have regulatory affairs. The goal of this team is to really provide strategy and guidance for other departments within the company when it comes to guidelines that are set forth by regulatory agencies. You know, I imagine regulatory affairs as a phone carrier, right? So they manage the communications from the regulatory agency like the FDA or the EMA on one end. And on the other end of the call, they have the pharma, pharma company. Um, so they're kind of like the middleman. Next, we have health, health outcomes and economics research. So this team really finds data to support um, by combining clinical data and economic data to really gain insight into a medication's value to patients. I will actually go into more detail of this function also later throughout the webinar, so I won't dive into this one too deep. And then finally, we have marketing or commercial. Um, this function also spans the drug's life, life cycle from the very beginning stages because as this department, they have a heavy hand in building the strategy of brand messaging of a drug and the pharma company. So as that drug moves along the pipeline and we're conducting more clinical trials through each phase, uh, the marketing and the commercial team is really there to tailor that brand messaging, messaging to our targeted patients. Now that we went over the different, different departments within a pharma company, um, this kind of sums them all up. We mentioned the details of each of these teams and departments, but let's look at where specifically the medical affairs team sits as a team and also how it fits into that picture of really building a strategy internally with these other teams here, whether that's research and development or also commercial. So now we have, we're taking that zoomed in focus of medical affairs. How can we even define medical affairs? What is medical affairs? What, is, what does this team even do? Um, so let's think of how medical affairs is actually a bridge, how it acts as a bridge between the R&D team and the commercial team. And they act as, as this bridge because the functions of medical affairs the main two functions are data generation and data dissemination. So the data that we get that is generated from research and development in those clinical trials, that data is then disseminated to the medical community, including HCPs, but yes, also to patients. And remember who we mentioned handles and tailors that brand messaging of a pharma company's product? That's commercial. So that's when commercial comes in. And that's why we see uh, medical affairs acting as that bridge. And the medical affairs role as a team is evolving. Uh, we're really seeing that the exchanges we have with physicians and other healthcare providers are really focusing on a higher scientific level when it comes to educating on disease states and the many different treatment options. And with the rise of technology, you know, we're also seeing a rise of digital capabilities and tools that are really giving the pharmaceutical company their own personal insights into what the healthcare system needs. And this strategy is largely handled by medical affairs. So here we can see the difference over time between PSRs or pharmaceutical sales reps, which was trad traditionally a function within sales and commercial, right? Compared to MSLs or medical science liaisons, which is a popular function within medical affairs. So here you can see that when the first data point captured of MSLs here in the orange, um, the first data point captured of MSLs employed, sales reps there in the blue, they were on the rise. But with the increased need of that high level scientific knowledge, we see this switch occur. And that's because pharmaceutical sales reps, they usually don't have any clinical background. Um, they're very business focused. And when compared to medical science liaisons, again, who we'll get into next, Medical science liaisons have the background of many of you here with some type of clinical knowledge, you know, whether you're a pharmacist, a physician, or a PhD level. And this is actually the structure of a medical team within a pharmaceutical company. So if we're starting from top to bottom from a CMO, the chief medical officer and working down, we see medical affairs as one of these functions next to you know, other teams within the medical team. Um, but within medical affairs, I'd like to highlight here that medical affairs can be seen as an umbrella term, right? So medical affairs is not just one focus, one term, and we have plenty of medical affairs professionals Underneath this umbrella, we actually have many multiple functions and different roles. Um, and so we'll actually go into each of those next. 
But before we hopped into each of the details of each function, uh, let's see which function is the most popular. You know, what do you know so far? Which ones are you interested in before we review those details? So we'll have another poll question that'll pop up on your screen. All right, so again, before we hop into the details, um, please select the answer as to which area of medical affairs are you most interested in? And then again, I'll give you about, about 30 seconds here. All right, and we see here that the, the results that we see are actually kind of similar to the results that we see for you know, the number of roles and functions, what are most popular and what are most common within medical affairs in the industry. Um, so first we see MSLs or field medical roles. This is one of our most popular and widespread function within medical affairs, and we'll go into this one as well. Um, and then we also see some interested in other roles here, med info, psychoms and publications, H-E-O-R, and also pharmacovigilance. So we got a widespread, I'm, I'm very happy to see this. So we'll go into each of these roles next. Um, the first up, we have med info. So within medical information, you'll see, you know, my icon that I listed here is kind of someone with a headset because I like to picture med info as a call center, right? So we see here within the first bullet, their responsibilities include um, to respond to questions from HCPs or patients on specific products and in, in its data. So the med info person or the individual within medical information on this team, they're sitting here and they're waiting and they're waiting for these incoming questions that physicians have before they prescribe a medication or they use a product on their patient that they just can't find. Um, you know, not everything is found on Google, but they may ask is, hey, is this medication okay for a patient with a specific comorbidity? Um, so med info, they'll go through, you know, the, the uh, supporting materials and documents like clinical trial data um, that the pharmaceutical company already has in order to answer those questions. Um, medical, medical information professionals also develop materials for medical affairs teams as resources when they're interacting with other healthcare providers or KOLs, um, key opinion leaders. So in order for you to develop these materials and have this knowledge of, you know, what data you should look for, some of the skills that are required by these professionals in order to succeed um, is you have to have a high level of attention to detail. Um, you really also have to, have to understand how to analyze and interpret evidence-based medicine. Um, again, because you're, you're using data provided by the pharmaceutical company, whether that's clinical trial data, um, we can have the numbers, but we also have to know how to analyze those. You know, what does this data even mean? I mean, you also have to have good writing skills. Again, they're developing these materials. Um, so developing materials in visually pleasing formats, whether that's a, um, a PowerPoint or a slide deck, or whether that's also, you know, a topic write-up. The average salary of medical information specialists, we see it's about 70K, with the range being between 42 and 124 um, on those extreme ends. Next, we have scientific and medical communications as a function within medical affairs. Um, so within this function, you see I have a pen um, that's written here, and that's because this communications that we're speaking of are usually written. Um, so they really have a hand in medical writing. And so they develop and produce documents um, across the life sciences industry. Um, the deliverables can, again, range from PowerPoints, but they also come to specified and particular um, formats, whether those are web pages, uh, documents, blog posts for a specific life sciences industry. Um, and you're really that middleman between a subject matter expert and the pharmaceutical company, which we see with contract research organizations. So sometimes pharmaceutical companies, they'll hire an outside organization, for example, here, a CRO, a contact contract research organization, in order to build those publications that we see, um, the final version. So they'll supply them all of the data that they need, and then the medical communications personnel or the medical writer will then turn that into what we see as the, the complete publication. Um, again, so the skills that are required to succeed in this role are kind of self-explanatory, right? You have to have that sound scientific background to, co to uh, complement your good writing skills because it's majority of your role, right? And here you have to have the ability to write for whether your audience is in healthcare, so for physicians or also for the general population, if those uh, documents happen to be blog posts, you know, anyone on the internet are also reading these. This average salary we see is about 89K with a range between 50 and 118. And these numbers are US dollars as well. All right, so this is that most, most popular function that we saw that was voted on, the medical science liaison. Um, so our medical science liaisons, you see the icon, I, icon here that I've included um, is that the 
we see two people sitting at a table. They're having a discussion, right? In medical science liaisons, because there are field medical affairs prof uh, professionals, they're in the field and they're discussing one-on-one -on, -one on a peer-to-peer -peer level with other healthcare providers, whether those are physicians or pharmacists, anyone providing healthcare and possibly you could utilize information with your own employer, whether that's a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company or a medical device company. And they're real relationship, again, is to educate and discuss clinical trial data, disease state information, but also to build those relationships with the medical community, um, especially key opinion leaders, building those relationships in order to build scientific, um, scientific knowledge and driving that scientific conversation. So the skills required here for a successful MSL is, you know, we see the clinical background, the clinical knowledge that is required but MSLs also have to possess a strong business acumen. Um, you really have to build up your soft skills here because you're speaking to physicians, right? You have to be a great communicator. Um, you have to be a great speaker. And that's something that a lot of MSLs or those applying to MSLs to kind of fall short on. Um, so here we really want to focus on your clinical and scientific background, but also your um, leadership and your speaking engagement skills as well. So here we see a bump in that average salary that we've seen so far. So the average salary of a medical science liaison, this is really dependent on which therapeutic area you're working for or which employer that your employer is, whether that's a pharmaceutical company of medications or a medical device um, and things like that. So we see the average is about 150 um, and the range is still higher here with a range of 120 to 200,000 a year. All right, next up we have HEOR or expanded out, this is the health economics and outcomes research. So the description of responsibilities here we listed, the first bullet we see pharmacoeconomics. Um, so it really says it in its name, right? We have to break it down, H-E-O-R, health economics and outcomes research. What did they do? Um, they really, you know, if you look up H-E-O-R in Google, it'll probably tell you something generic, like they help payers and government um, and also physicians to make sound and educated decisions. But what's that decision making idea thought here? And it's cost. And that's why I have, you know, an image of coins here. We think of money. So H-E-O-R, they do this by providing information needed to review, you know, the value, the entire value of the medication. But that can really come from multiple points. How can we really assess the value of a medication? We have to not only think about, of course, how safe and efficacious the medication is, um, but we also have to look at costs because we care about money and payments, right? So HEOR professionals, they combine that clinical data, those clinical outcomes and endpoints, and they combine that with economic data to really gain insight into a medication's value to patients. So HEOR, they're pretty new, but it's actually rising because the value of this team is being highlighted among the life sciences industry. Uh, where it sits, specifically within pharmaceutical companies, they can vary from organization to organization. Um, some HEOR teams, they sit in medical affairs, but others, they may sit in commercial or reimbursement. So with that being said, you know, the skills that are required to be successful within HEOR is of course your background. So not only do you have to have that clinical background, but some type of business or economics background as a supplement, if you're interested in this role would really help when reaching out and looking for these roles specifically. The average salary of an HEOR specialist um, is about 130K with a range of 104 to 157. And finally, we have pharmacovigilance. Uh, so with pharmacovigilance, this function within medical affairs, um, their description and their responsibilities include uh, post-marketing, preclinical, and even the clinical phases. So we see pharmacovigilance across the board, the lifespan um, of a drug development cycle. And so with pharmacovigilance, uh, we kind of see another name for it possibly being drug safety. So you've probably seen that as well. And so they really conduct post-marketing surveillance of the drug, including that safety data, data and its use in the real world population. Uh, so pharmacovigilance is kind of understanding the implications of risk versus benefits. You know, we hear that a lot, risk versus benefits. Pharmacovigilance in this team is really answering that question of are the benefits of this medication outweighing those risks that possibly could come up? Um, and so that's how they're comparing those risk versus benefits of the medication. And so these skills, of course, is a life sciences background, a scientific background in order to, to monitor for those safety signals. The average salary of a pharmacovigilance specialist or a drug safety specialist is about 140K a year uh, with a range of 91 to 168.
Alrighty, so now that we've discussed the different functions of medical affairs, I'm gonna ask you the same question. So the, que the same question we saw previously will actually pop up. Um, of which area of medical affairs are you now the most interested in after we reviewed the responsibilities and the salary and everything of each? All right, so I'll give you about 30 seconds to a minute here. All right, so looking at the answers to this poll question, comparing it to the first time, I see some people have switched switched, or, you know, crossed over. We see, um, I'm not sure if this will pop up in the recording, but um, the first question, we had a leading score of medical science liaisons of those interested um, among our participants. And it was about 40%. So now we see the results, still medical science liaisons being in the lead, being more popular, um, the most common, but now we see it pushed up to about 55%. So um, I'm glad to see, you know, some, some shifts. I'm glad that we're thinking about what better, best suits you for each role. All right, so now that we've gone through the different functions uh, within medical affairs, how do you get there? How can I build my career or my experience in order to get to my desired career goal? I mean, the answer to that question is like, there is actually many options. You know, one being direct to industry here. So direct to industry, this means that wherever you are now, whether it be in school or a non-former role, you jump straight or directly into an industry role without any extra training. So another option here we see are fellowships. Uh, many pharmaceutical companies, they offer fellowships where you'll gain about one to two years of hands-on experience uh, within a specific department at their organization. And this kind of depends on your background and your de degree when looking and searching for specific fellowships. And then finally, another option, another pathway into industry is extra, tra extra training through board certification. Um, so by becoming a board certified medical affairs specialist, when applying to these industry roles and medical affairs functions, hiring managers and directors will then see that you're an expert in the field. Um, you know, because there are multiple options here that we've, we've gone over just really briefly of getting into medical affairs, let's just review some opportunities and also some of the challenges which, with each of these routes, and we can see and tailor which is best for you and your, your goal for uh, medical affairs. So the first being direct to industry. So if you're looking at ways to enter the industry for a higher pay, um, these roles can be challenging for you. So we first start with opportunities, some opportunities to directly you know, gain insight into the industry or internships. Um, these internships, they can last anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, but this is a good way to get that entry level um, experience where you know, you're shadowing someone, but you're also gaining that hands-on experience. Um, also entry level roles. So out of the, the roles that we and functions that we've went through, some of those entry level specific ones are pharmacovigilance and medical information. So this is kind of a good way to get your foot in the door. You know, starting with a lower salary pay, but now that you have your foot in the door, you can gain hands-on experience in order to keep moving towards your final goal. Next, we have networking and also leveraging past experiences and scientific knowledge. So you really have to leverage where you are now and the experiences and the functions that you, you currently um, have to complete for your current role and leverage that, whether those are in interviews or your resume or your CV, in order to translate that over to the industry. And this is something that we can also help you out with. Uh, with challenges of these direct to industry opportunities. Again, if you're looking at ways for a higher pay, if that's your, your purpose or your goal um, for going into the industry, um, again, these roles can be challenging because they are offered at a lower pay than other roles that require experience or extra training. And because usually applicants to these direct roles have little to no experience, sometimes recruiters and hiring managers, um, they like to see tailored education to medical affairs specifically. You know, just so they know that you have at least been exposed to this role and you know what you're talking about. Okay, and fellowships. So fellowships, the opportunities here, um, they're very open to many terminal degrees. So if you're here on this call and you're looking at fellowships, these are usually tailored to PharmDs, PhDs, or MDs, depending on, you know, again, your specific background. And these fellowships, they give you that hands-on experience that usually lasts about one to two years. So you can build those direct uh, connections with pharmaceutical companies, other teams within that pharmaceutical company, and you're in rotation so that you can go through and figure out all of those medical affairs functions that we just mentioned, which one do you like? So you're there working, understanding which ones you like and which ones you don't like. So the challenges here, depending on um, which specific fellowship that we see, 
a fellow's compensation can actually range from about 40 to 50 K each year. So again, if your main goal is to, you know, enter the industry uh, for higher pay, another route possibly may be a better route for you. And they're usually geared again towards doctoral level degrees. So if you're a nurse or a nurse practitioner, those fellowships may be harder to come by. And finally, board certification. So becoming board certified in medical affairs, it really shows that you have taken the initiative in understanding the industry, understanding how medical affairs teams work cross-functionally, but also in taking the driver's seat, right, in your career and your personal professional development. All this is shown once you're becoming board certified. And there's actually multiple board certifications available. Um, but let's highlight ACMA's BCMAS program because not only is ACMA an accredited organization, but the BCMS program provides you with, again, not only educational training, but also it helps you build your business acumen and your soft skills, which we've mentioned before that that's an absolute must have when working in medical affairs. So if you're interested in the program, let's go through this column here together, the first column of ACMA BCMS. So you can actually enroll in the BCMS program if you have either of these requirements. So if you're a PharmD, an MD, or a PhD, or if you have at least two years experience in the life sciences industry. When enrolling, you actually gain access to 20 e-modules, which are all available online to you and your global lear learning platform. So I mentioned that these modules are all online. This is important, so you can enroll today. You can enroll at 2 a.m. tomorrow morning. You know, you have that option in order to work through the, the course at your own pace. I mean, I also mentioned that the BCMS program is on our global learning platform. Our platform being global is very significant because if you're one of our attendees today and you know, you're in Europe or Latin America or Canada, wherever you are, when you enroll, our system will actually assign you to the appropriate region specific content of where you're located. So for example, if you're in Europe, you'll actually learn the content specific to those regulations that are set forth by the EMA. And these are actually some other, uh, some other benefits that uh, you'll gain when you enroll into the BCMS program. So again, the training, pro training content in that global learning platform, but also you'll access updated quarterly content, updated content that is updated quarterly, um, and also live 24 seven support. So you'll have an ACMA team member. Um, it feels like one of us is going through the program with you as you go through those 20 modules. Now, how can you stand out? Now, I, I selected a, a specific screenshot here that I've read about um, MSL openings. So again, MSLs and medical science liaison, this is the most common function within medical affairs. And so we see here that for each MSL opening, there are about 200 applicants on average. So how can you stand out amongst 199 other applicants on paper? You know, whether you have the experience or you're not, these are some points that I like to mention or I like to highlight for those who are trying to enter into the industry. So the first being professional development. So we mentioned how professional and career development is important when taking the initiative. So taking the initiative and signing up for leadership work workshops, signing up for mentorship programs, you know, really just developing yourself so that when you are in the medical affairs space, now you know how to lead a team. You know how to lead a project. You can also stand out with speaking engagements. You know, we mentioned within medical affairs, some of those specific roles, you have to speak to physicians, you know, especially being a great communicator and communicating that scientific knowledge, using speaking engagements as practice will really build your expertise, not only on your resume, but when you land that role. Writing samples, you know, as a pharmacist or an MD or a PhD, you can really be a freelancer. You know, if you're working somewhere, whether that's in retail pharmacy, wherever that is, and you're finding yourself you know, hard to get into the industry, but you're looking for ways how you can increase your writing experience. You know, you can contract out and begin writing blog posts, write as much as possible in order for you to add those again to your CV or your resume, especially for those writing specific functions and roles that we mentioned earlier. And then finally, becoming board certified. Um, becoming board certified, you stand out because on paper, now you're seen as an expert because you hold that accredited board certification. And with that, I'll actually leave the screen up for a while. So I mentioned uh, board certification. Um, this is where Abby and I, we both come in. We like to help and educate 
um, more about our programs, including BCMAS, that board certification in medical affairs. So this is actually both Abby and I's contact information. And so I'll leave this again so you can screenshot or write this information down um, while we go through the questions. So this is a time I'll open the floor um, to see what questions came in during the web webinar. Um, I'll step back and let's see. Abby, what questions do we have? Got it. Um, thank you, Kenna, for all the detailed information you shared with us. So we have received questions from our audience, and we are going to answer some. So um, first question is, is a fellowship necessary or required to be a medical science liaison, especially for a recent PharmD graduates with no prior experience? Hey, thanks for your question. So Specifically for pharmacists um, inter interested in becoming a medical science liaison, a fellowship is not required. Um, it looks good. You know, I know that fellowship season is coming up. And so it looks great on paper again because you have a direct, com direct connection to that pharmaceutical company. But there are other routes as well. So you becoming board certified, for example, you know, taking initiative and taking that extra training. So the BCMAS program actually goes into detail of what is important to medical science liaison. We'll go over those interactions, like you mentioned, um, that we've mentioned before, those interactions with KOLs, what regulations are required to follow, because it's a strict, you know, regulated industry, BCMAS program dives, in that, and dives into that specifically. So to answer your question simply, no, and fellowship is not required. Got it, thank you, Kenna. Um, second question is, um, how successful are BCMS professionals in landing a role? Oh, awesome question. We actually have data on this. So we've actually found that about 90% of BCMS graduates, they land a role within two to three months after completing the BCMS program. Thank you, Kenna. Um, we have an attendee who has a question. Um, I will allow, uh, hold on. We will allow her to ask a question live. Hi there. Uh, I'm uh, my name is Sinclair. I'm an MD uh, in Brazil. Is it possible to work uh, as a in the uh, pharma industry as medical science liaison uh, in the United States without having the uh, license to uh, work as a, a doctor as an MD in the country? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And that's a question I've received before. Um, the answer, the simple answer is yes. So when you're looking to work in medical affairs, what they're looking for is that scientific background. You know, yes, while you have not practiced, you still went, to, um, a, went through a medical program that was extensive. And you went through this extensive training program to understand disease states and products and treatment options. And that's the information that they need from these medical affairs professionals. So when you come over, I would again highlight, highlight when applying to those positions, your clinical and your scientific knowledge, your degree, what you learn in your, your specific program. Thank you. Um, and the last question will be, which of these role would you suggest a retail pharmacist apply to? So for retail pharmacists, um, you know, again, as a pharmacist, I'm biased. So I'm going to say all of them. Um, I, I can see a pharmacist, they're best suited for any of these functions in any of these roles. Um, but for us, for specifically a pharmacist, I would recommend an entry level role, um, such as again, pharmacovigilance or med info, if that's an option, you know, when it comes to that pay difference of a retail pharmacy, um, but also the medical science liaisons. So with retail pharmacists, retail pharmacists, I worked in a retail pharmacy before, and so I know what it's like when you first you're speaking to a patient, you know, you're using layman's terms about hyperlipidemia. You, you can't say hyperlipidemia, so you use those in terms that patients can understand. But because the retail pharmacy world is so fast and fast paced, while you may be speaking to a patient one second, you now have to go and hop on a phone call and speak in a highly scientific knowledge where you can speak of hyperlipidemia. So that quick switch in knowledge from a layman's terms to clini clinical communication is very important, again, for medical science liaisons as well. Yeah, now we have a lot of questions coming up, so I'm going to read it out loud. Um, okay. Next question is, is the board certification recognized on high value in most or majority of pharma companies? 
Yes. So again, the simple answer is yes. So with the board certification, because we are accredited, uh, we're actually recognized internationally. And our, our network has now become our partners. We, our network has really been built with specific pharmaceutical companies where we actually go out and we'll train or board certify their entire medical affairs teams. Thank you, Kenna. And next question is, how long is the ACMA board certification program? Oh, so when you're when you enroll for the program, um, you actually afford it six months of access to the content. Again, this is completely self paced, but we see on average it takes about two to three months because there is 40 hours of content, but you have your entire six months time that span of um, that span of period span time timeline that's six months to complete the program at your own pace. Thank you so much, Kenna. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope you find it very helpful. Um, we will be hosting this monthly webinars on medical affairs and the MSL career, career paths. Um, if you have any question, please do not hesitate to contact me and Kiana and enjoy the rest of your day.